Welcome to the Money Answer Show with host Jordan Goodman. Whether you are starting out, deep into your retirement, or somewhere in between, the Money Answer Show has the know-how to help you. Now here's your host, Jordan Goodman. Welcome to the Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Martin Friedson, known as Marty Friedson. He is an expert in high-yield investing. Um, he is the editor of a newsletter called The Income Securities Investor, uh, which is at isinewsletter.com. And uh, he's a real expert on the whole area of income investing. Welcome to the Money Answer Show, Marty. Great to be with you today. So just give us, you had a long history in this field, but just give us a brief uh, kind of summary of your history and how you got to this place you are today. Yes, I uh, began way back in 1976 as a corporate bond trader with an outfit called uh, Mitchell Hutchins, which was a uh, what, what uh, was known at the time as a research boutique uh, firm with uh, very high quality research effort. Uh, I was not part of it at that time, but it uh, rubbed off on me, I hope, in positive ways. I later moved into credit research, uh, initially at Payne Weber and later at Salomon Brothers, uh, some firms that don't exist quite in their form today, but were you know, very major ones in their day, and uh, then went over to Morgan Stanley to head the corporate bond research credit research area, and then later uh, joined Merrill Lynch with a specific focus on the high-yield bond market, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, today, and uh, later uh, had an independent research business, uh, uh, got into the money management business, and uh, today I'm a partner in this firm that you mentioned, uh, well, that uh, is connected in some ways with the newsletter, Lehman, Livy, and Fritz and Advisors. And we focus on income investing, and it, that business is an outgrowth of that newsletter, Income Securities Investor. And Very along good. the way, I've written a number of books on uh, financial markets, uh, as well as uh, uh, financial economics. Very good. So let's kind of start with a broad view of where we are today. The world is in an incredible tumult. Talk about it specifically as it relates to income investors, and what is the, the issue for income investors today in such a volatile market in both stocks and bonds? Well, if you're investing for income, first and foremost, you want to maintain a steady level of uh, dividends and payouts, interest payments, what have you, from the various types of instruments that we'll talk about. But I think it's very rare to find an investor who's literally completely indifferent to the fluctuations in market value of the portfolio along the way. Uh, I think that it's just natural to be concerned about that, and rightly so uh, from the standpoint of the possibility of permanent losses of capital. Uh, for example, if you own a bond that defaults uh, through the company's bankruptcy, you'll probably uh, recover some portion of your original investment. The average figure you hear cited on that, a little bit of a simplification, but uh, on average you recover about 40 cents on the dollar if you paid 100 cents on the dollar or par when you first bought it. Uh, so you'd have a 60% loss of principal. Well, that's money that you will not be able to plow back into the market and reinvest to generate income. You'll only be able to uh, reinvest that 40% that you retain. So above all, you want to avoid that type of permanent loss of capital as opposed to a paper loss or a loss in market value, which will generally be temporary. Uh, that's uh, not an easy message to accept right now, uh, given the magnitude of some of the declines that we've seen, um, and it is important not to be complacent and say, well, everything that has gone down is sure to recover. You have to take a close look at what you own, but it's very important to make that distinction between uh, temporary losses in market value that have no impact on that monthly check that you're receiving and permanent losses of capital that do reduce your ability to generate income from your savings going forward. The one thing people are concerned about is, are dividends that have been declared 
for many years, companies with long histories of paying dividends going to cut those dividends a lot or cut them out altogether. Are bonds, even of highly rated corporations, a Boeing or something like that, going to at least be downgraded or potentially default? What is your sense of, of what the economy is going through right now and the e economic impact of that on income securities? Great question. And the place to start in that would be to describe those instruments that you just uh, spoke of in terms of uh, priority in the capital structure, kind of a fancy term, also referred to as seniority. But what it means is that you have a pecking order in terms of payment within a corporation. So uh, the, the most vulnerable is the common dividend. That is paid every quarter at the discretion of the board of directors. It's usually, and for most companies, taken for granted that they're going to pay a dividend equivalent or larger than they paid last quarter. But there's no uh, legal or contractual requirement for the company to pay that. So if times get tough, that's where they're first going to tighten the belt. Um, meaning that's what you were expecting? You were expecting uh, yeah. some dividend cuts? We would definitely see that. Uh, right now, there's an issue where... The, it's conceivable that the Federal Reserve will actually require banks to eliminate their common dividends. Uh, don't think that is likely at this point, um, or certainly not a, uh, a, a, a given, uh, because there are, there are good arguments against that. You know, the banks say that, th that even eliminating the common dividend would undermine confidence and be counterproductive. But uh, for other, if uh, you get away from that, you know, where you might uh, cut into confidence in the financial system, which could be quite damaging for the typical industrial uh, company to reduce its dividend would not have those kind of uh, repercussions and might be viewed as necessary uh, by the board of directors to conserve cash during these difficult times. But continuing with that pecking yep. order mm -hmm. um, in the capital uh, structure. The preferred stock dividends are, that's a much more serious issue. That is uh, more of a contractual arrangement um, in, in the sense that in many cases, those preferred dividends are cumulative, meaning that if they decide not to pay the preferred dividend in a given period, they uh, must reinstate that preferred dividend before they can resume payment of common dividends, and they cannot continue to pay common dividends while uh, not paying the preferred. But, so do, finally, you think, do you think uh, some preferred do you think some preferred dividends are not going to be paid and, and uh, in effect you know, made cumulative for the future, but that they'll get that far that they will stop paying preferred dividends? It, it is all a matter of how severe the recession, which has probably already begun, turns out to be, how deep and how uh, sustained it turns out to be. The uh, preferreds tend to be, uh, or they are concentrated largely in the uh, financial sector, including banks and uh, finance companies uh, and such. Uh, but there are utilities and some industrial companies that have preferreds as well. So can't rule it out. Uh, they're, they're, they are considerably safer. And if you're talking about money center banks, um, it, things would have to get to a very, very serious pass uh, to have those uh, sort of too big to sa fail so-called banks uh, be, uh, beginning to omit preferred dividends. Okay, so this preferred, then the next level down, I guess, would be corporate bonds before you yeah, get well, to stock, well, right? well, I guess I would say up, <laughs> but uh, yeah, next in line, the corporate bonds, yes. Um, Failing to make a scheduled, typically semi-annual uh, coupon payment on a bond is an event of default. Uh, the uh, bondholders have the right to accelerate, and, and typically you do see the company go into bankruptcy as a result. So that's a very severe uh, outcome. Obviously, the board of directors is going to avoid that at all costs, but it does happen in an average year, 
uh, 4% of speculative grade issuers default on their bonds. These are bonds rated below triple B. Uh, the investment grade uh, universe uh, ratings go from triple A down to triple B. Below that, from double B down to D for default, but going through single B at triple C, double C, and single C. Um, so what kind of default rate are you expecting? If it's normally 4%, what kind of default rate are you expecting for investment grade okay. and for below investment grade? Yeah. Um, let me just say that normal, uh, I, I would characterize more as average. You really have almost no years where the speculative grade or high yield default rate is 4%. You get a lot of years uh, where it's 2 or the last the last 12 months it's in, been in the range of 3%. And then in recessions, it rises over typically a period of a couple of years peaking somewhere in the low double digit range. And it, it, those years all average out to 4%. But again, you if almost never, if ever, see a year where it's actually 4%. I just want to no. clar clarify that. But uh, uh, Standard & Poor's has already uh, taken the view that by the end of this year, the trailing 12-month default rate will be at 10%. Um, Moody's uh, will have a, an update of its default rate forecast out within a few days, and uh, I suspect at, at, at a minimum, their pessimistic case will be up in a similar range. I, I think that even their base case will be- That's um, the high yield, the high yield you're saying. Yeah, that. that's the high yield. Yeah, the investment grade, um, you really have it, uh, very few companies going from investment grade to default within the space of the year. Now, some do even triple A's, although there are not many triple A's left, but historically some that were rated triple A over a long period of time migrated down the credit quality scale and eventually got to speculative grade and then defaulted. But uh, you really don't have to be worried about bonds, particularly in the non-financial sector, going from investment grade to default within a, a short period of time. So uh, you might get to, uh, you know, some of the, you know, in a, an extreme case, as much as a, you know, 1% default rate on investment grade bonds uh, that you know, are, are probably rated at the bottom end or triple B today, uh, or that began the year at that level. And by December of this year, will have been downgraded uh, so many times, though, have gotten down to something like triple C and then go into default. Yeah. All right. Well, that's reassuring anyway. All right, we're going to take a break. Uh, this is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is Martin Friedson. Uh, he is the editor of a newsletter called Income Securities Investor. You can find out more at his website, which is isinewsletter.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Marty Friedson. He's the editor of the Income Securities Investor Newsletter, which you can find out more about at isinewsletter.com. Welcome back to the show, Marty. Great to be with you. I'm going to go through the various categories of high-yield investing that you talk about in the newsletter. Just give me a sense of whether you think those are better or higher risk or lower risk or, or attractive to in income investors these days. Let's start with closed-end funds. Those are funds that issue a certain number of shares on the stock exchange. They trade a discount or premium to their net asset value. They can offer some very high yields. What, what is your general view of closed-end funds and maybe one or two you think would be good at today's levels? Well, uh, the, uh, the the category has the uh, essential risk of leverage. In other words, they yes, they buy underlying securities, but they uh, borrow uh, typically about a third of the capital structure, uh, so that you get a higher yield, but also greater volatility as a result. And uh, it's very important to be selective within that category um, be, because uh, the, 
you know, because of the leverage. And also, uh, the, the second uh, very, uh, very important factor is the discount or premium that you're paying. Uh, many of these trade at a discount to their net asset value. In, in other words, if the fund were to be liquidated immediately uh, and, and the fund is at a discount, then you uh, would actually have more value than the uh, aggregate value of the shares. Now that sounds like a great thing, but often that, uh, that discount reflects a poor record by the management of the, uh, uh, the fund. So in fact, it's not uh, as much of a bargain. And I found recently that in the, the, the recent downturn related to the Corona virus, the funds that were trading at premiums among those that we had uh, recommended uh, were actually went down less than those that were at discounts, which I think probably surprised a lot of people who would just think, well, gosh, the ones that are premiums must automatically be, uh, be more vulnerable. Yeah. So just give me one or two names of what sector within closed end funds. Some of them do bonds, some of them do stocks, so there are quite a few of them offering income. What would be one or two that you would still like at current levels? Yeah, well, uh, you know, a couple that um, are, uh, you know, uh, still at premiums or close to it, and uh, which I think in this environment would be worth uh, paying attention to because they, they would reflect uh, good uh, records on the part of management. Uh, we, uh, it would include FLC, uh, the Flaherty and Crumrine Total Return Fund, and uh, GGT, the Gabelli Multimedia Trust. Uh, and um, I guess throw in one more. Uh, again, you know, this, uh, I think from the name, clear the uh, focus of it, uh, PIMCO Dynamic Credit and Mortgage Income Fund, ticker there is uh, PCI, Gabelli with GGT, and the Flaherty and Cumrine, uh, FLC. So those are uh, some you may look at. But I think it's important to notice that these are very, tumultuous times and uh, it, the it don't be certainly looking for an immediate uh, rebound in uh, really anything we talk about today. Uh, yeah. You know, you know. Okay, another area is master limited partnerships. They've been very popular the last few years. They basically transport oil and gas from where it's found to refineries and storage facilities and tankers, things like that. Obviously, oil prices have fallen sharply. What is your current view of MLPs? Yeah, we're de-emphasizing MLPs in the money management business that I spoke about. We've actually been doing that for a while, but this uh, most recent uh, set of uh, uh, conditions has accelerated that. Um, the pipeline companies, the transportation sector, uh, which you'd talk about, and that, by the way, there are uh, MLPs that are involved in the riskier portions, in other words, those more directly exposed to the uh, fluctuations of oil or gas prices, uh, those certainly very, very uh, hazardous right now. And the, of course, the conditions I'm talking about are the uh, unsettled state of the uh, global oil market as a result of uh, an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Uh, two of the biggest producers, uh, they, they had had an agreement in place to limit production and therefore provide a floor under prices. That ran out. They've not been able to uh, uh, get that back on track. So, And there's some feeling that Russia in particular is hoping to drive many of the domestic uh, shale producers out of business and thereby end what has turned into a chronic oversupply. So the result of this is a tremendous uh, pressure on prices. It bottomed out a little while ago. There's been some rebound, but it's still a very uncertain case. And the, the point of all this is that historically, it was thought that the uh, the pipeline companies that issued ma these master limited partnerships were immune from the oil price fluctuations because after all, they get paid on the basis of how much natural gas or oil they transport through their system it doesn't matter what the price of that commodity is. They're just getting paid so much per barrel or so much per billion cubic feet uh, of, of gas. 
Well, what we found in the downturn in 2015 and 2016 is that these securities did turn out to be sensitive to the oil price, not so much because of direct exposure, but of a concern that in uh, the most severe case, the oil companies that were shipping the gas uh, or oil through the pipeline would go bankrupt, and therefore whatever contracts they had would be voided by the bankruptcy. And so their revenues were not as secure as had been thought. And that has only become more of a concern, and rightly so, in this latest downturn. So uh, for the time being, I, I think I would uh, hold back did you avoid the entire entire sector? Or are there one or two that you still like? No, I think for the time being, I would just not uh, look to put money to work there. If you're going to put money in the market, there are better places now. If we get to the point where it looks like there's uh, some hope for longer term stability in energy prices, that would be a time to take a, a look again. But in the meantime, uh, it, we're going to continue to feel, uh, feel pain in that uh, that sector. Do you think oil prices will recover? I mean, say there is an agreement between Russia and Saudi Arabia, they stop this game of chicken. Uh, is it possible that oil prices will rebound once the economy gets back going again? Yeah, all those things are true. Uh, and I think we can count on the economy coming back. The only question is when, and uh, it could be a long time for that to happen. Um, and as far as Russia and Saudi Arabia coming together. The latest word from them was that uh, from Saudi Arabia was they might consider uh, limiting production, but only if other countries get involved in that too. And that could include the United States. And we don't have an authoritarian government here or a state owned oil company whereby we can just say, you know, cut production by uh, X million barrels a day. That's possible for Saudi Arabia and Russia, but not here. So uh, there are a lot of hurdles to be crossed before you get to that uh, kind of a, a stabilization, which we hope for, but uh, don't count on it necessarily happening. There is a meeting of OPEC and other major producers later this week, and that may give us some clarity uh, on the conclusion of that meeting on the 9th. Very good. We're going to take another break. Uh, this is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is Marty Friedson. He's the editor of the Income Securities Investor Newsletter, which you can find out more at isinewsletter.com, all about income securities. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Martin Fridson. He is the editor of the Income Securities Investor Newsletter, which you can find out more about at isinewsletter.com. Welcome back to the show, Marty. Thank you. So we've talked about closed-end funds. We've talked about master limited partnerships. The next one is preferred stocks. We talk about that a little bit, but give me a sense of the attraction of preferred stocks in this current environment. Well, um, the uh, the general story on preferreds is that uh, you they because they're somewhat uh, subordinated in the capital structure. You have, in many cases, investment grade companies that issue a preferred, but uh, that is rated lower just on in the nature of the way the bond rating agencies work. So the the uh, the preferred may be uh, slightly down into the speculative grade category and reflect that in the way that it trades and on the yield that it offers, but you, you do have an investment grade company uh, behind it. Uh, yes, they can omit the preferred dividend without declaring bankruptcy, but it, it's a pretty strong step uh, that they'll tend to avoid if possible. And the other uh, general attraction about preferreds is that there's um, many of the issue sizes are not that large. And as a result, they can't really uh, be owned uh, by very the very big money managers, trust companies and such, because uh, they just can't buy enough of it to make a, you know, a, a difference for their, uh, their portfolios. So uh, there's not a lot of research on this sector. Uh, the, the downside is that that also uh, involves some 
uh, illiquidity in the trading, but uh, if you uh, follow the market closely, you can find times when they genuinely are just trading out of line at levels that don't quite make sense and find a real bargain. And you can uh, invest in this as an individual investor uh, much more readily than you can in the corporate bond market where the round lot size is a million dollars. You can buy smaller pieces of preferreds. So what would be an example of one or two preferreds you would like at current levels? Well, as we talked about earlier, it's very unlikely that um, we will get to the point where the uh, money center banks would have to cut their preferred dividends. It, that would be a really severe blow to confidence in the banking system. So if you look at, uh, for example, J.P. Morgan, uh, we have uh, their preferred uh, C. Uh, their, these goes in series with uh, different uh, letters attached to them. But that's a 6% uh, coupon on that. And that is uh, rated investment grade, BAA2 by Moody's, triple B minus by Standard & Poor's, reflecting the high ratings on the parent company. Um, you know, Citigroup, uh, we have uh, on their 6.30% preferred, uh, which is Series S as in SAM, and uh, that is uh, slightly below uh, investment grade at BA1 by Moody's. But those would be a couple of examples of the types of uh, quality that you can uh, get at uh, comparatively uh, depressed prices right now. And typically, uh, a lot of preferreds that were trading up above their call price, in other words, they could be redeemed prior to maturity or redeemed uh, if they're perpetual preferreds uh, redeemed at all, uh, they could be uh, redeemed. And then, in other words, that yield that you're getting would be taken away from you. You'd have to reinvest at a lower rate. That With the drop in prices, that's much less of a concern than uh, than it was. How about buying preferreds through funds? There are some closed-end funds, even some open-end funds that specialize in preferreds. Is that a better way for people to do it? Um, not necessarily. Uh, it's, it, it is a vehicle. It's, uh, it's uh, simpler as an approach, um, and you do get the diversification benefit uh, from yeah. that. Uh, they, uh, you know, notwithstanding the diversification, it's not as if those are uh, completely devoid of some of the volatility you see in the underlying preferred. So I would say uh, do uh, careful research, uh, but if you're comfortable with the uh, the risks that you see and then take a look at how they perform in the recent market, uh, that, that certainly is a, uh, a valid option. And would you have a favorite there, a preferred fund? Um, uh, I, I don't know that I would single out one particularly. Probably the best known is uh, uh, goes the ticker PFF. And, uh, you know, if you're looking for the sort of brand name in that market, maybe you yeah. consider that. That's an index fund. That's an index ETF. With, it's not an actively managed portfolio, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. So there are a couple. Yeah. There are a couple different types of, uh, uh, you know, uh, packaged uh, product to look at. But yeah. if you're looking at to do that, I, I would say that probably be the uh, uh, the, the you know, the easiest uh, choice within that. Okay. Now, another thing we could talk about is REITs, real estate investment trusts. They own institutional real estate. Could be a mortgage REIT, could be an equity REIT, could be a hybrid. Some do commercial real estate, some do residential, some do healthcare. Now, people are worried today that uh, a lot of tenants, both residential and commercial, are not going to pay their rents, or at least not pay all their rents. Is that going to cause a bunch of uh, dividend inc- uh, decreases in REITs? Yeah, we uh, we fully expect to see dividend reductions in the REITs. They, uh, you know, the attraction uh, again in those is that there is a sort of a tax preferred kind of approach. You know, income is passed through uh, in these. It's a special vehicle created by an act of Congress to encourage investment in the real estate area. But other types of uh, companies have been able to. Uh, use that uh, you know vehicle as well. Um, uh, you know other you know in other words other types of uh, companies including data uh, uh, data centers, um, senior housing. Yeah. Uh, is there in, some in, area in REITs you like particularly today? Well, um, you know the the, uh, the the straight real estate. Uh, the, you know there's 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 some real question marks about there. It's hard to 
find a, uh, a sector there where you're talking about shopping centers, which even before these concerns were uh, under uh, threat because of the inroads of online shopping and you know the you know we're far overstored uh, much more retail space in the United States per capita than in other developed countries so th there's a lot of vulnerability if you talk about office uh, buildings you know uh, you we may see more people working remotely after the experience of uh, uh, you know trying that out in the um, uh, you know in the recent uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, recent, uh, the current uh, yeah. pressure. Uh, you know, there are some that are, uh, believe it or not, related to um, uh, amusement parks. And um, if you know, you know where uh, kind of right. pressure they're under right now. So I would be reluctant to single out anything uh, for uh, recommendation within the wreaths right now. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, though. Uh, there may be some uh, better uh, staying power within some of those outside, you know, strictly uh, defined uh, uh, real estate. How about like healthcare REITs? Do you think they'd benefit from all this? Uh, well, there, uh, there's certainly uh, healthcare uh, problems uh, coming from those are, you know, afflicting, uh, afflicting the, uh, uh, the population and then, um, yeah, there'll be more business. I don't think that the challenge right now for hospitals is getting enough, uh, uh, you know, enough um, patients. Uh, you know, yeah, no, yeah, enough customers. business now. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, they so yeah, it, it, that's a uh, something to uh, you know. I, I think maybe I, I would say some some of these things that were worth a, a, a better look after. We have what probably will be the next uh, downswing. Uh, it would be very rare to see a bear market where you just hit bottom and then go straight up from there. So I think. Yeah. You know, so you're very cautious about the REITs in summary yeah, on that. Right? Yeah, I would say, yeah. Okay. Another area that income investors like these days is BDCs, business development companies, which make loans to medium and smaller sized businesses that can't get traditional loans. Uh, what is your view of BDCs in the current environment? It, well, we don't uh, cover those in uh, by in the um, newsletter, and um, in, in our money management firm, we have not played in that area. Uh, it, it, there's been rising competition. Uh, you know, I think some of the strongest ones are going to uh, survive, but uh, you know, rising competition in that business has put pressure on lending margins in that business. So um, it's uh, not not an area that uh, we've gotten involved in. Um, although, you know, you know there's certainly there are some very uh, hefty looking yields, whether those yields will right. turn out to be attractive or not in the end is, a, is another question. Yeah. What is your outlook for gold? Uh, and are there ways of playing gold as a kind of an alternative hedge in this environment? Well, gold is not an income investment. I mean, uh, other than, you know, possibly gold stocks, but uh, so it's not something we uh, focus on. One thing I would say about gold is that um, there was a lot of head scratching in the recent period. I said, why is gold going down while stocks are going down? They move in opposite directions. And the New York Times even had an article uh, entitled Weird Things Are Going On in the Markets. And one of the weird, supposedly, things they were talking about was the gold Price is falling, and people were trying to explain this and saying, "Well, people are selling what they can sell, what's liquid, uh, because they're so frightened." So, in this strange anomalous way, gold, the you know safe haven, is going down at the same time that stocks are. Well, let me tell you, I looked up the record over the last 25 years. The breakdown between when stocks and gold moved in the same direction versus when they moved in opposite directions was almost exactly 50-50. It was 51 in favor of moving in opposite directions and 49 in the same direction. When stocks were down by 5% or more, it was somewhat better. It was a little over 30% of the time uh, yeah. that, you know, that uh, you know, they sort of moved, as you say, in the wrong direction, but um, it's still not anything like a hedge over a short period of time. Yes. 
the, the, I, I, one study looked at the FTSE uh, stock index uh, in the UK uh, versus gold and found that if you have a five-year horizon, um, yes, gold does tend to be an offset for your equity exposure. But no one should be looking at this at gold as anything like a hedge over any uh, you know, short period of time for their exposure in stocks or bonds or really anything uh, right. else in the investment field. Very good. We're going to take another break. This is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is Marty Fridson. He's the editor of the Income Securities Investor Newsletter, which you can find out more at isinewsletter.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest this hour is Marty Fridson. He is the editor of the Income Securities Investor Newsletter, which talks all about ways of earning income. Uh, Their website is isinewsletter.com. Welcome back to the show, Marty. Great to be back. <laughs> so we've talked about closed-end funds, master limited partnerships, preferreds, REITs, oil, gold, and BDCs. Now, your original expertise is in the high-yield junk bond market, um, where yields are incredibly high now, but the worry is about more defaults. How do you pick amongst uh, the junk bonds and, and find some value there? Well, first of all, I would say for the vast majority of investors, uh, buying through a uh, mutual fund, um, possibly an ETF, is really the best way to go uh, because of the diversification that's necessary. I mean, if you get a default uh, and lose 40% or you know, 60% possibly of your money on that default, plus going through a period without receiving interest, uh, then you know, you're, it, it, you know, you've, you've had, taken a very big, Low. If you have, on the other hand, a diversified portfolio and typically a couple of hundred issues by buying through a fund, it's well worth whatever fee you're paying on that to, um, you know, to own that uh, that that uh, packaged vehicle. So um, uh, that that would be number one in terms of uh, you know buying and and you know uh, part of the reason for that again, as I mentioned earlier, that round lot in the corporate bond market is a million dollars. So to create your own diversified portfolio is really going to be out of the reach of, you know, the vast majority of individual investors. Now, um, the uh, process within the uh, market in terms of selecting, uh, there are people who are paid very well, uh, you know, to do that on a full-time basis following a limited number of issues very, very intensively. The, the basic uh, criteria are uh, financial measures such as uh, coverage of interest, uh, the amount of free cash flow generated by the company, you know, after their capital spending, uh, how much uh, are they able to generate uh, for you know, debt service and other uh, purposes. Um, you know, like to see a nice cushion there. The amount of leverage, uh, the amount of uh, debt, uh, total debt of the company. Uh, related to their earnings before interest taxes, diversification, and yeah. administration. So measures like that, but very importantly, the quality of management, the strategy, um, their reliability in terms of treating bondholders well, which is not high in a lot of cases uh, yeah. because their concern is really more for the equity holders. So, so would you stay away from all of them or the industries that are most distressed, like oil or airlines or things like that? Or are there some areas you still think have potential to, to be bought today no I mean if you were to get uh, involved at the uh, you know the individual company level some of the uh, uh, classic defensive industries although they're not cheap and you know, because the market recognizes their defensive quality you know utilities actually last month held up the best of any of the major industries they're not the sort of mainline um, electric power companies that you know but more merchant power uh, companies, which is a little different sector within that industry, but uh, you know they did hold up comparatively well. The cable and satellite TV industry, not cheap, but uh, again, uh, a sense that aside from the 
longer term risk of cable cutting, um, uh, you know, a sense that people will continue to pay that to have, you yeah. know, even in hard times. Uh, so those are a couple that, um, you know, are, uh, you know, have more defensive characteristics. But again, you know, within those, you know, they're going to be gradations. Yeah. Uh, the market will tend to give you pretty good guidance based on the yields as to which are the less lesser risk or higher risk ones. But I, again, don't want to encourage people to go out buying high yield bonds at the uh, individual bond level. So what would be some funds, either open-end funds or closed-end or ETFs, that you think would be have good management in this field? Well, you know, uh, we don't make recommendations on open-end funds. Um, you know, there there are some who have been at it a long time that are, are uh, you know, do well. You know, some of the household names in the industry, you know, like Vanguard and BlackRock are in the business. You know, PIMCO uh, is in there. Uh, I think it's a good uh, good idea to take a, a look at a source like Morningstar, uh, which is, is very open about the fact that the past performance uh, may not be indicative, and it's not the case that a five-star fund automatically winds up outperforming in the future. But I would take a look at those, you know, again, some of the uh, household names. I'm, uh, I apologize for any I haven't mentioned. I'm not trying to exclude them, but uh, I, I would uh, take a, a look at a source like that uh, and, you know, particularly funds that have a long record and where you can find that the management that has compiled a good record is still the management yes. in place. Now you've talked about, we, we talked about a lot of different things, closed-end funds, MLPs, preferreds, REITs, oil, gold, BDCs, and junk bond funds. What role should diversification play in an income investor's portfolio, particularly in, in light of today's situation? It's very important, always uh, uh, important, and particularly so right now. The different sectors that we've talked about are subject to different kinds of risks. The uh, preferreds, as I mentioned, are concentrated in the bank and finance sector, so uh, interest rates and uh, credit conditions are going to play a big factor there. You know, the MLPs are uh, sensitive to oil prices. Uh, High-quality corporate bonds are sensitive particularly to fluctuations in the general level of interest rates, whereas the high-yield bonds will tend to be more sensitive to economic conditions. Well, if you put that all together, then you generally have something that's performing well, even if everything else is doing poorly. And that has worked pretty well over time. Right now, you know, this is a, a really unprecedented situation that we've been through over the last month and a half or so. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a period where the, uh, the saying goes, correlations go to one, you know, everything moves together, which is not the case under ordinary conditions. Yes. So the diversification has not helped you a lot uh, very recently, but uh, going forward uh, will make a difference. And uh, again, when, if we get back to any kind of normal conditions, it's just essential to diversify by type of uh, asset as well as by name within any of those asset categories. Yeah. In the roughly two minutes we have left, why don't you kind of sum up what you think invest, income investors should be doing in this very volatile time we have today with all the different things we spoke about? I think you should be being conservative. Uh, feel, uh, keep in mind there's no rush about putting money to work with the idea of catching a bottom and a huge rebound. There will be time for that. Uh, you will not uh, hit the exact bottom in the market anyway. So if you miss a little bit of it on the way up, that is not the end of the world. I would take a close look at the holdings that you have. Um, it is a time, uh, at the risk of saying the obvious, to harvest tax losses where you can move into uh, similar securities um, at you know, comparable yields. Um, if you are a, an aggressive investor, there's even an argument for uh, selling some of the things that move down less than others and plowing that into the securities if you can be comfortable uh, with the quality and the ultimate survivability of those who that have fallen more and therefore have bigger bounce back potential. But again, that is a, a, a very risky, uh, you know, aggressive uh, stance to take in, in the current market. In general, are you kind of optimistic or pessimistic about how this is all going to work out in the end, considering these huge stimulus packages you're seeing from the Federal Reserve and the 
central government. What is your overall assessment of how this is going to come out? Yeah, long run, I uh, want to continue to be optimistic. I would say I'm probably a little bit on the pessimistic end of the spectrum compared to what I see uh, you know, guests on CNBC day, saying from day to day. You know, there are uh, many who seem to be very eager to proclaim a bottom and say it's all up from here. I think we are likely to see another major down leg, uh, at least one before this is through. Uh, the, the, uh, the Fed has certainly done about everything it can. I think it's to be commended for that. Uh, Congress took an important step in the $2 trillion package they put together, but that really was a relief measure, you know, providing some support for people who are not going to be working, keep yeah. companies out of insolvency. But in terms of really providing a stimulus, it's going to take an infrastructure bill, if that's politically feasible, to achieve and more to really provide stimulus. And when it happens, that will only happen as it generally does with some lag. Yes. So yep. we have to be you know, uh, cautious about how soon we really can uh, expect Very things good. to turn around. Very good. Well, thanks so much. My guest this hour has been Marty Fridson. He's the editor of the Income Securities Investor Newsletter. You can find out more at isinewsletter.com. Thanks so much for a great show, Marty. Thank you. And we'll be back next week with another edition of The Money Answer Show. Goodbye for now. Thank you for joining Jordan Goodman and The Money Answer Show. If you have a question for Jordan, please visit his website at www.moneyanswers.com. And be sure to tune in every Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here on Voice America Business. See you next week.